Good morning. All right. As I promised, when um, this book came, I said that I would review it. So you saw my other video. I don't need to tell you much. This is the late Ed Young. So we were frenemies, friends and enemies at different times. And we were both black belts under Jeff Mack at one point. I started the system in 1985. I think he started uh, maybe sometime in the 90s or something like that. Um, probably around 1989 or 1990, I met him. I think he was a brown belt. I got out of the military around 92, and by then he'd been a black belt. So, um, without further ado, I'll get into the book. And I know this is going to seem seem weird, but I'm going to also talk as if Ed is still alive and still listening. It just helps me better to communicate about the book. So, Ed, you're passed away. You're dead. Um, we have had our differences and we also had our collaborations. So just going to say, um, good book, straight up good book, uh, encyclopedic book of point sparring, because it's not just strategies and techniques. It talks about, uh, various concepts and principles, Bruce Lee's, uh, you know, ways of attack, um, training, conditioning, reflexes training and conditioning cardio it doesn't give you a lot of a lot of exercises for that and even a little section i'll show you here on you know a lot of signals that referees use so this was designed to be a comprehensive book about the game of karate taekwondo kung fu point sparring point sparring started by karate people and it was basically the early karate people i think in the late 40s or early 50s were trying to come up with a safe format for practicing karate and making a sport out of it. And they adopted rules from kendo. Kendo is based on the principle that if you get stabbed or cut with a sword, you die if you get stabbed or cut properly. So um, empty hand fighting, not so much, especially at range, which is why many people like me are like, this isn't real. This isn't... Uh, how any martial art, empty hand martial art, would actually intelligently be used. But it became a game, and it became, at one point, a very popular game. It was never mainstream. I don't think that ever happened or will ever happen. But within the martial art world, at one point, it was a popular way. So, uh, yeah, I would easily give this book an A+, plus in terms of if you, if you don't want to get into point sparring, and uh, you want to succeed, it's all there. You know, you still have to do the work and you still need a coach and you still need uh, training partners. The book was published 2011. So I don't know if this was pre or post his um, Battle of Atlanta title win. Um, but then again, you know, uh, He'd definitely been training with Bill Wallace for quite some time, not necessarily training with him in person. He joined the Federation. He got ranked in it. Uh, Bill Wallace travels there and stops to do seminars. I know he loved going to seminars. He could afford to. I couldn't afford to very much. Um, so I see a lot in there that's Bill Wallace. I see a lot in there that's Joe Lewis. We, we together, the both of us and Kurt Komoda, I believe, went to um, – a Joe Lewis seminar, and this was before Joe Lewis's uh, passing. And um, Joe Lewis's seminar was more on on kickboxing and full contact, and less on point sparring and you know kicking and things like that. So Ed was a little disappointed, but me, I love the work on boxing. I love the drills and the head movement. I thought that was great, and I began to incorporate it as soon as possible. So you can see we have different mentalities. Um, there's nothing in this book. That I would say it looks like bad advice. The as far as point sparring, uh, a lot of things you do in point sparring are dangerous in full contact. Um, more like mentality wise and physically, if you allow leg kicks, a lot of the footwork and the way you set up your kicks really sets you up to be leg kicked. So, if I had a student that was interested in competing in points, or if you know, like what would get me into point sparring at my age? Well, I still, I still believe, uh, you know, I've, I've sparred a lot of these guys and, and I could hit them and 
they couldn't run away. And, and if the action didn't stop after the first blow, I had no problem hitting them. I had no problem hitting Ed. He had no problem hitting me. But once I started hitting harder, he had a problem. Right? We, we trained differently. We fought differently. We were built differently. Um, you know, competition, I, you know, I'm short. I'm better built for grappling than I am for kicking. I love to kick. Still do. Still love the high kicks. I was doing them yesterday, teaching at Zen's gym, uh, working with the kids and adults. But, you know, ultimately, if I can close into punch range, use knees and elbows, traps, and take you down and grapple with you, I, you know, generally do better in that range unless you're just better at that than I am. Or, you know, you're, you're super young and diesel, right? We all have our things that we're good at. Ed was tall, lanky, and very quick with his legs. And when I met him, not so skilled with his hands. I will say, Ed, you uh, definitely, from looking at all the pictures, you a lot of the stuff I talked about and encouraged, and people around you encouraged you to get into, you finally got into. You finally got into Filipino martial arts. You finally got into Jeet Kune Do, which you made fun of. You finally started using, you know, different boxing things like the shoulder roll and the shell and things like that. So finally, and obviously it added to your experience. It added to your expertise. So, um, you know, for example, if, if some corporation or some wealthy patron said, hey, I want you to represent me and I want you to be a senior division, you know, I'm 52, competitor in point sparring, I'd be like, fine. I would you could pay for my training and my upkeep and my living expenses, provide me with the facilities to train, pay for, you know, someone would pay for me to go, the, go to these things and compete and pay the entrance fees and the hotel stays because it is an expensive hobby, right? There's there's no money in it. If If I was being paid to do it, even at my age, I think I could do it. And following principles in this book and other book, and of course, having coaching and having sparring partners, I think I could do it. Your body doesn't take a lot of punishment point sparring. You lose speed as you get older. But if I was competing within my age bracket, it wouldn't be as much of a factor. I'm, you know, compared to many people my age, um, I'm, I'm doing pretty good with joints and things like that. I feel like I still got my speed with both the hands and legs. So that that's the only thing. Do you want to do point sparring or not? Do I advocate it? I think some point sparring, especially when you're younger, like early in your career, you don't want young people taking a lot of shots to the head. You don't want to take battering leg kicks and, you know, be hit with elbows and knees in the clinch when you're younger. You want the brain to develop. Um, that's cool. If you are, you know, maybe an older competitor and you, again, maybe you've got a day job, you don't want to risk losing your teeth, getting cuts and things like that. It's not a it's not a bad thing to do. It's still a sport. It's still an activity. Get out there and train. It's good for you. Um, if you're a serious fighter, want to be a full contact fighter, a boxer, a kickboxer, a Muay Thai person, an MMA guy, some limited point sparring can help you with your reflexes. Some of the training is still good fitness, good flexibility, but ultimately you have to train specifically for what you want to do. If you're a world-class rugby player, uh, and you take up baseball and you don't know anything about it, you're not going to be that good. You're going to have strength, speed, stamina, but you don't know the specific skills. And the set of attributes that you have might not be perfect for baseball. I think in baseball, um, the ability to accurately aim that bat at the ball and visually track it and hit it hard, strong upper body, that's a thing. Strength, power. Rugby, you do need strength. You do need power. You don't use your hands much. You use it some, you catch. Soccer, it's more legs, right? Tennis, being great at tennis doesn't guarantee that you're going to be great at track and field and break sprinting records, even though tennis people are fit and they sprint up and down across the field. So same thing. So I'll just say the name of the book. Sport Karate Point Sparring, an Essential Guide to the Point Fighting Method by Ed Youngsa and forward late Ed, Ed Youngsa and forward by Bill Supertrip Wallace. Yeah, Ed. Uh, good book. Good book. Um, you were a consummate point sparrer. That was your thing. And uh, you succeeded at it to the degree that you did. But, you know, ultimately, there's not a lot of money in it. And for a guy like me who 
I love two opposite ends of the martial arts. And this used to drive Ed and other martial artists I knew wild because it didn't make sense to them. I love beautiful, long, complicated Chinese forms. I love the beauty, the art, the philosophy of the martial arts, the esoterica. But then I also love the practical, you know, up close combat fighting art. And I like, um, using, you know, self-defense techniques and trying to extract meaning from what to many of my colleagues seemed like useless forms and things. And that's part of my challenge. That's what I love about the martial arts. And my experiences with fighting, actual fighting in the street, getting beat and winning. And for me, winning is different than for many people. I don't necessarily want to beat up the other person. I want to control that situation and neutralize it, right? But also, I want to be able to deal with life and death situations, you know, people trying to kill you and also trying to control people and not trying to kill them, right? It's kind of a weird contradictory thing. We're all wired di differently. So um, it's uh, point sparring in the sport scene never really interested me. Uh, you know, I went to boxing gym. None of these guys went to a boxing gym because I think they weren't prepared to get hit in the face that much but I was willing to pay a price and take at least some face hits for a limited time to learn how to deal with it and how to dish out that punishment as well. So I guess, you know, we both got what we wanted and you got your point sparring skills and I got the skills I wanted. And so ultimately, you know, you get what you work for given the right condition. You know, obviously if, you were born without legs, your chances of being great, a uh, great world champion points bar are, are, are zero. There might be a, a handicap division and maybe you'll do something there, but you know, you're not going to be the next Bill Wallace, right? You're not going to be the next Conor McGregor if you have a genetic predisposition to broken bones. But within the realm of what you have and what you want, you can work for it, you can strive for it, and the knowledge is out there. So, um, I am, I, I feel vindicated because I kept stalling to you, Ed, the virtues of Wing Chun trapping. I see it in your points barring book. I extolled the virtues of the universal block. You weren't doing that much with it. It's in there. Maybe you got it from Bill Wallace who uses it. I extolled the virtues of the footwork of the Filipino martial arts and, uh, Kali. It's in there, right? There's a lot of interesting stuff with working with focus mitts and shields that are specific to point sparring and, you know, uh, maybe not, not so useful to kickboxing, but obviously when it comes to kicks, punches, blocking, and defense, there is cross. So anyway, I hope that was a useful review and I hope you all have a wonderful day.